Hey, how's it going? It's MJ Vallejo, host of the Creative Crucible podcast. I have a special episode for you today. Um, I have a good friend over here. I'm not even going to wait until the end of the episode to do the plugs because we're going to plug everything. We're just going to plug everything that you're involved in and or what you're about just so we know how special this episode is. So what's good? What's good, MJ? I'm excited to be here. I've been waiting to be on your podcast. I'm so excited to be here. Thanks for having me. When I first started this podcast, it was because of you. I started this podcast because of you, and uh, I lightly touch on it um, with some of my former guests. But man, when I we've only known each other for a little bit over a year now. Yeah, I was wondering if it's even been a year. I don't think it's even been a year, to tell you the truth. Yeah, definitely not. So, <laughs> it's, 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 I think our one year friendship uh, anniversary is coming up in the next couple of months, though, for sure. Oh, okay. Are we going to celebrate? Are we, how are we going to celebrate? I think we should do an episode of Eat Up Silicon Valley. No, I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> yeah, you know, maybe come to Sankers and uh, go to Black Point and, and get a Mustamba or a meatball sub or something. Okay. <laughs> and for everybody listening who has no idea what the heck Black Point is, Black Point Market. So it's this little neighborhood market where I live in Santa Cruz on the east side, kind of close to Pleasure Point. And it's just, like I said, a neighborhood market. It's small. And it's like, you know, kind of liquor story ish. And you wouldn't really think that they would have good food, like, because it's right, you know, and um, their food is amazing. They have this one sandwich I love called the Mustamba. And that stands for mozzarella, muz, tum, so tomato. But basil, so it's mozzarella, tomato, basil, and then you add turkey and the panini style with like a buttery crust, so good. Right, but it doesn't come with the turkey though. You have to add the turkey. Got to add the turkey. Okay, so I think they should just <laughs> they should just rename that sandwich to like the Sam. The Sam, maybe the MJ, because you come out here f- specifically for it. No, we just went there before recording this, and um, you got the meatball sub, and you said it's better than that famous Italian restaurant by your house. So that says how good this place is. Yeah, it really is. I feel like Santa Cruz is full of gems and hole in the walls. It's a vortex. It's going to suck you in, and you're going to move here soon. Oh, okay, cool. Well, I mean, that sounds really good because Vortex was my favorite uh, ride at Great America when I was a kid. <laughs> there you go. There you go. I love it. But back to who you are. So oh, yeah. when when I first met you, the very first day I met you, you literally introduced yourself as Swag Sam. <laughs> so the thing is, though, just a little background. Uh, I, I was contracted with the studio. And then when I walked into that studio last year, beginning of last year, you're finishing up a podcast episode. And then that's how I met you. And, and you introduced me. I'm Swag Sam. Like, wow, that, that's the only other Sam I know is Sourdough Sam. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, you were uh, doing uh, some filming for the Brigand Bag or something like that. Um, but yeah, I, I was like, oh, I was asking him, who's this guy doing all the videography? Because, you know, I'm like totally into content. And um, sometimes I'm feeling more douchey than others. So maybe I'll introduce myself as Swag Sam. But I'd say about 90% of the time, I just introduce myself as Sam, not Swag Sam. So you're okay. welcome that you got the personal brand introduction. No, so um, jokingly, I went to an office. Uh, let me back up. I sell promotional products, aka swag. So that's why it's Swag Sam. It's not that I'm a total douche. And it's like, oh, I have so much swagger. It's like, no, Swag Sam. How I got the name is I went to an office supply conference because I sold office supplies too back in um, 2012. And I was just talking about swag because in the office supply industry, I know it's crazy to think that like people sell office supplies outside like Staples and it's like a legit thing. But anyways, um, the, one of the complimentary lines of business is selling promotional products, swag. So I was talking to all my peers about swag and most of them didn't sell swag because I started selling swag, then office supplies. So I couldn't really relate to the office supply side. So one of the girls jokingly called me swag Sam. And this is back in like 2012. And then I got started in podcasting in 2017. And once that started to take off, I, I I went from like it being a joke that my name was Swag Sam on Instagram to like owning the Swag Sam brand. And fast forward to now, I've produced nine podcasts, three of my own. Um, I wrote three books in a year. I have a couple YouTube channels that you helped me out with. Thank you very much, MJ. And um, yeah, that's kind of like the Swag Sam brand. Dang, who would have guessed that the whole Swag Sam name would have been like just a dream come true for? I can imagine it's like a good SEO 
type of deal, you know, when people are looking for corporate swag. Because I hear the word swag all the time. Because when it first came out, swag was like, uh, it, it was like a, do you remember the rapper Soldier Boy? Yeah. He, he had um, a song called um, Turn My Swag On. Turn My so Swag it, Yeah. So it was all about, you know, just uh, flexing uh, the jewelry and your expensive, like, <laughs> Gucci jackets and all that. Right. But now I feel like swag is a corporate word. Well, it's so funny you say that because I have written many blogs, or not many, but I've written blogs um, and probably touched on this. Uh, I'm talking in circles here because I was going to say I've written many blogs about how our industry has an identity crisis, and I haven't written many about that specifically, but I've touched on it a lot, maybe my books too. But yeah, the promotional products industry has an identity crisis because in the 90s, it was known as ad specialties and probably late 90s early 2000s like people would start to say swag and um, most recently a lot of people say promo or promo products or brand branded merchandise things like that but I would say swag for like branded merch came cool maybe five years give or take ago and you see it all the time in pop culture you know people are talking like you said the corporate is um, saying swag and um, it's definitely one of those things where it's timely for me to have a company called Swagworks and my name be Swag Sam if our industry changes in the next few years and has a different word um, that represents us then so be it do you rebrand whatever stay with it I'm not too concerned but we have an identity mm-hmm. crisis that's the thing. Yeah, hopefully it doesn't uh, do something. Uh, it doesn't turn into something like the word dope or anything. Because now dope it's products, <laughs> dope products. But see, you know, back in the '80s, dope meant something else. Okay, so uh, <laughs> I don't know why our industry was ever called swag. I don't know, but swag is actually an acronym. And I recently learned this a couple of years ago. Um, most of the time, when you see branded merch referred to as swag in written word, it's capitals. Capital S, capital W, capital A, capital G. So, but not with a period after it. So you'd never think that's an acronym. But once I found out what the acronym means, I now don't spell it in all capitals because I don't like the acronym. And the acronym is because I was bearing the lead. Stuff we all get. That's a negative. That's like tchotchkes, you know, like that's, that's crap. Like MJ, you know me, like I only sell like premium stuff. Just yesterday, someone wanted to buy like $2 um, charging cable cords. And I told them, I'm sorry, I'm not going to sell these to you. You know, I I can show you some other things. If you want to get them, there's plenty of other people that will sell them to you. But quite frankly, these are junk. They're going to break and it's going to make your brand look bad. And they're going to contribute to more waste in the world. So I'm very much like against like all the crap in our industry because there's so much crap in our industry. And the acronym for swag stands for stuff we all get, which kind of represents the negative side of our industry. But Sam, that was that was a sale. Why was it why was it important for you to not make that sale? You know what? It's just um one thing and there's a psychology, it kind of positions you as someone who cares and someone who knows what they're talking about and more is the expert. So then that client will trust you more. And then also it's the morals and ethics. And that has to go with uh, the ego death experience of doing ayahuasca and psilocybin mushrooms last year um, and realizing my role in the world and not too proud of the role I play in that. So having to uh, be like, you know, it might be a sale and I could tell them invest the money elsewhere um, for different products and I can still get that business potentially, which usually is the case. Or maybe they look at me and they go, this guy's an asshole. I, I believe we can curse here, right? Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, and then they don't want to work with me, but I don't care. I'm speaking my truth. Okay. So you said something about an ego death. So I mean, I I understand that you run uh, several podcasts, and you know you have a you have cloned yourself, so you have a professional podcast, but you also have a spiritual podcast um, called Soul Seeker. And it and I was listening to your Soul Seeker episodes, and it, it's almost as if um, your your spiritual journey ties in with the professional journey as well. So like, how has something like what you mentioned earlier the the ego death? How has that benefited your business? Oh, totally. Um, That's an interesting question about benefiting the business. I'm not sure that I would say that my spiritual awakening has like benefited my business, but has benefited my soul, right? Like now I'm on, um, 
this spiritual path I went down the rabbit hole of spirituality and um I would I don't know off the top of my head, like ROI, if you want to say it that way, like I could tell you ROI all day on podcasting and how I've gotten business from podcasting in general, but from soul seeker specifically, the ROI has been, you know, love. It hasn't been a business thing. And, um, I think the business side of it will come eventually, but for right now, like I'm just trying to figure out, who I am and what I want to do in with this human experience. Yeah. Yeah. And I think what I mean by benefiting your business, um, I, I don't exactly mean like the numbers or like if you're increasing sales, because I think if you're a happy, any happy business owner is a pretty good business, right? right. Um, you know, uh, you know, numbers and sales and whatever aside, it's like if you're happy doing what you're doing or like, you know, if you're just in a better mood, I think, overall that's benefiting your business cuz so yeah. I'll, uh, that's okay so i w- it hasn't benefited it hasn't it, it's actually hindered um that's why i had trouble with that question mm-hmm. because part of the ego death was seeing my role in this world and not liking my role so I'll, you want me to walk you through the story? I'll try to do a quick version. No, I, I would love to. I actually, okay. uh, I'm really interested simply because um, I think in recent years, we have all learned uh, this whole psychedelic thing and uh, Silicon Valley CEOs doing them. So Totally. Yeah. Okay, cool. So, um, you know, I had a lot of depression that I was dealing with, blah, blah, blah. And that force, er, that led me, not forced, that led me to doing ayahuasca, which was opened my heart and an amazing experience. And you can hear all about it in Soul Seeker podcast. Then a few weeks later, I did a psilocybin uh, magic mushroom journey for healing, a retreat. And I mean, I've done mushrooms like probably 30 times in my life over the years, but I've never done it intentionally for healing, like with a ceremony and like with guides. Just like for partying? Yeah, just recreational party. Okay. Yeah, you could call it that. Um, so, yeah, I, I say that there's a difference between, uh, do I say partying? Yeah, partying with psychedelics versus healing with plant medicine. So this psilocybin journey I'm talking about was healing with plant medicine. And we went up there to the cat or to Yurt in the Santa Cruz Mountains, and we did all the thing. I'm not going to walk you through all that, but basically the mushrooms kicked in, and... I started to get very angry very quickly. And my journey was like seeing our society and our world for exactly what it is. But to be more specific, these roles we play in business, like think about it. We are the only species on this planet that works. Like how I see a bird flying right now. How many uh, birds and, you know, we're right by the water, seals, fish, uh, sharks, whales, whatever. And then there's all the land animals. Like we are the only ones that work. Everyone else is clearly just concerned about survival, right? Like, so for us, like our survival, it isn't about like, oh, if, well, I mean, depending where you live in the world, we're, we're blessed. If you want to say blessed, we're great, grateful and lucky to live in a safe part of California. But there are plenty of parts in the U.S. or anywhere other part of the world where people could die any day because it's not safe. Right. So that's survival. But for us and a lot of people in the U.S., our fears based off of money, our fears based off of this, this, uh, work life balance that we're told where it's, we have to work the nine to five and we have to be in these jobs and we have to be, you know, always providing and we're always afraid and we don't do stuff because of money. And, and really the system where most places in the world, but I can speak to America mostly is to keep us as slaves to the system and to n- not have us question what's going on because the people at the top the, from the founding of America, it's always been so that, you know, the middle class has just enough. And, you know, we have this work-life balance so that we get paid time off so that we get to have our vacations and whatnot. And it's like, what the hell is work-life balance? Like that's some bullshit that we are fed. So I'm having like this whole like thought process of that and I'm getting angry and then I end up stepping outside of the yurt and then I start seeing my role in this and I go, I'm in marketing and advertising. Like I, not only am I helping these brands, any brand get bigger and more of this bullshit, like 
what the hell is marketing and advertising? Like, look mm-hmm. at all the other animals. Look at like how we were uh, back in like caveman day or whatever. Like, we don't need marketing and advertising. I I start thinking about all the other industries and. The only industry I could think of that we might actually need is healthcare hospitals. But the thing is, we don't need those. In our current state, we need those because of the illnesses that we've created. But if you go back to the history of man, there were no hospitals or anything like that. And then you could say, oh, we need cars or we need planes. And I mean, we don't need any of this, right? So I'm starting (laughs) to just think how ridiculous all this is. Right. Well, yeah, because I look. We the only reason why we need cars or planes is because uh, it, it's all business related or work related or or travel and whatever. But yeah. it's our modern day society. And I mean, don't get me wrong. I've been traveling a bunch this year already, and I plan to travel even more this year. So I'm very grateful for cars and planes and hospitals and things like that. But I'm just saying. It, it's you start to look at insurance, you start to look at my role in advertising. So this is where it really hit me. I'm sitting there outside the yurt, and it's um, you know, it's late at night. The facilitators came out and brought me a Sherpa blanket to keep me warm. So I put the Sherpa blanket over me. It's a branded Sherpa blanket that I did for one of my clients. So no, I'm, yeah. So I'm starting <laughs> to think like, oh man, I'm starting to think like Game of Thrones, and like you know, they yeah. have those uh, big um furs, you know, the, from the animals. Yeah, and like as I'm I'm sitting here wearing this chubby's fur uh, jacket, <laughs> you know, right now at the time they're recording. But no. So my point is I was wearing this Sherpa blanket as a jacket. And I was like, this is keeping me so warm. Like, this is all we need. It's like Game of Thrones. Like, look at back then. Like, they just use furs. Like, we don't need all these jackets. And then I just landed my dream tech um, client. And like, I've always wanted to get this client. And um, they... D- I was doing jackets for them, either North Face or Patagonia. And I was just thinking how like stupid it is to have like, who needs another jacket? Like mm-hmm. we don't need another jacket. And uh, like, I'm, I'm so guilty of this. And then I have all these brands and then uh, I forget if they went for North Face or Patagonia, my tech client. But, um, then there was like a, uh, there was an inventory shortage of like, say five small or whatever it was. Mm-hmm. I, I suggested to them to do a different color, but keep the same size. They go, no, we'll keep in the same uh, color. Let's just get them like five mediums instead of smalls or whatever it was. They wanted to get a different size. So I'm sitting here like, this is why I'm on the mushrooms. I'm thinking about this, right? I'm like, you're going to spend like $300 on a name brand jacket that your employees don't even need. And then you're going to get them the wrong size and they'll never wear it. Like, great. Yeah. So, and I'm starting to think all this. I'm starting to, like, get disgusted in my role. And then I'm starting to think of the factories that create and the, the waste in the world. Then I look up, and about 10 feet in front of me is one of my branded water bottles. <laughs> and not only is it, like, a branded water bottle, the logo, the name of my company, Swagworks, is dead center staring me in the face. But was it's, that your water bottle or is it somebody else's? No, it was mine. I just, I was walking around, you know, so I happened to have it 10 feet in front of me and then I looked up, but the fact that the logo is facing me, it wasn't even like a different direction. It was just like, ah, you know, just culminating the whole thing. You know what that reminds me of? Uh, Do you remember the first Iron Man? Tell me the scene. So, so the, the, it was a scene in Iron Man, and like, uh, so it was like in the beginning of it where Tony Stark gets ambushed by like whatever, like the terrorists and things like that, and like he's just like running from all the gunfire and things like that, and he hides behind this rock um, to because there's like missiles and rockets going off, and then a rocket lands in front of him, and it says Stark Industries. Oh so yeah, the ba- I remember that. So the bad guys are using his products. So I felt like you had a little Tony Stark moment right there, dude. That is <laughs> such a great analogy. That's exactly what it was like. Yeah. Oh man, but I mean, you're still doing that. You're oh. still doing swag rich, though. Okay. Okay. So, so that was the story. That was the rabbit hole. But your question was, how has Soul Seeker benefited my business? So, okay. Here's the thing. Um, going into the psilocybin journey, I want to do a season of one of my old podcasts called Mojo Mondays about spirituality. So, and I'm sitting there having this whole awakening type experience, and then I'm like. 
you can't do a season of Mojo Mondays about spirituality, then go back to a season of like goal setting and business stuff. Like spirituality is everything. Uh huh. So then that's when I had the idea for the spiritual podcast. I didn't know what it was going to be called yet. And then I was really having an issue with my role and in society with my business Swagworks, and I was like, you know what? I can't just walk away from this great bills business that I've been building for 10 years that I've built and I, I work less than four hours a day in it and increase sales year over year. Like I've cracked the code. I know how to do it. Like I can't just walk away from it. It's not big enough where I could sell it or anything. I go, I'm going to figure out what I want to do with my career next. But in the process, I'm going to have this new outlet for this spiritual podcast where I just work on soul development. And hopefully somewhere along the lines, I'm going to figure out what I want to do, but I won't feel guilty and shame for what I do professionally because I'm using the profits from that company to raise awareness of mindfulness because that's what Soul Seeker is all about. And, you know, my whole thing is about raising our collective consciousness and creating more soulful humans that are more mindful. So, you know, I, I, that makes me feel better about my role. Um, so yeah, I hope that answers the question. No, yeah, definitely. Are you still doing Mojo Mondays? No. So if I were doing Mojo Mondays, I'd be doing four podcasts all at once. Yeah, right that's what so I my thought. My cap is three. My okay. cap is three. Okay, because I, when we first met, I I listened to Mojo Mondays. So like yeah. I was listening to you. So let me let me tell you, uh, or let me know if this is uh, accurate. Hey, it's Mojo <laughs> Mojo Mondays. <laughs> What up? Uh, uh, yeah, I remember. But, I you, did didn't it. See, but yeah. you didn't do what up? What oh, up? was it? Hey, hey, it's Mojo Mondays. Welcome back to another episode. It's your boy Swag Sam, or something like that. And like, no, I'm. I used to be. Not that I'm not now, but like when I need in your life, different influencers and motivational people and friends and whatever come and go in your life. But I'd say. Um, Eric Thomas, the hip hop preacher. Oh yeah, so he's the he, one. He's he, one of my big influences. He's the one that did the, uh, the about going into the ocean and then like breathe, breathe. The, yeah. Oh wow, and I have breathe shirts now. That's funny. I never thought about that. But I have one. Yeah, you do. So Eric Thomas would be. Um, Thank God it's Monday. Hey, what up? It's your boy E T. So and my thing was like. Hey, and welcome back to, or hey, it's Mojo Mondays. It's your host, Swag Sam. And um, what would I say? Like, because I'm here to pump you up for the work week, and there's no case of the Mondays here, something like that. Mm. I don't remember. But check out Mojo Mondays. That's a good podcast. But that was your first podcast. And then you did. No, uh, no, that was my third. Your third? When did you do? Uh, well, when did you do? <laughs> what, what up, Silicon Valley? What up was the first? What up was the first, and then Brand Hero I think was the second, and then I think Mojo Mondays was the third. Then the fourth was Soul Seeker, and then the fifth was Clone Yourself. That's oh. a lot, bro. Okay, three of them are active. I retired Brand Hero and Mojo Mondays. Like I might bring that back one day. I I haven't done a season because I moved it to seasonal. I haven't done a season for less than a year. It hasn't been quite a year, but um, yeah. The thing about Mojo Mondays is. Soul Seeker and Clone Yourself are kind of like offshoots of Mojo Mondays because each of them kind of takes a different, more niche approach. Because I would talk about mindfulness in Mojo Mondays and like meditation. And I would talk about business and goal setting. But I would say I really niched down more with Soul Seeker and Clone Yourself. I want to know how you got into all of these podcasts because a lot of because a lot of people typically use podcasts as just another funnel for their business, and like uh, I'm gonna admit, you know, I use it too because I, I of course I want to, uh, you know, go on to like any platform and just be like, hey, well, MJ knows what the hell he's talking about, right? But then you have you had like so many podcasts, so why why did you choose that form instead of just like going on YouTube or just like uh, doing a bunch of LinkedIn posts? So the, uh, the long uh, answer is I walked at Chico State in 2011, and I, uh, during my time at Chico, I was a rep for like Monster Energy drinks and campus spring break trips and stamp power boards and uh, what else, like anti-hangover, all this. So I always had like these brands and things that I represent, and then I started my own business called Chico Feet. 
which was uh, branded sandals because in the town of Chico, the common expression is Chico feet. It just means your feet are dirty. So I sold branded sandals called Chico feet. And that was a door opener for bigger companies to sell them promotional products. And like um, the founder of Sierra Nevada knew who you, who I was because he saw me on the news, like uh, Chico small town that took off and like I made a name for myself. Well, when I moved back home to Silicon Valley in 2012, I started selling office supplies. And then after a couple of years, I was like, I don't like doing that. So I went full-time swag and I became chair of the Silicon Valley Young Professionals. I was on a, bo- on a couple of boards for nonprofits and I was doing some leadership programs and it, it was cool and everything, but Silicon Valley is just so much bigger than Chico. And I was like, I need something here that's going to make me stand out because in Silicon Valley, a guy who sells office supplies and promotional products is a nobody. Like, right? Like, what? sounds like Dunder Mifflin. Yeah, totally, yeah, bro. Yeah. And I mean, Silicon Valley, like, you know, there's all this pressure of like just everything. But then also, you know, my story is I always compare myself and I'm. Like, yeah, that's why I had a chip on my shoulder to have those board positions and chair the young professionals and things like that. But it wasn't enough. And I looked around, saw a friend from college doing podcasting. I saw a friend from college doing YouTubing. And this I just visited this guy a couple days ago down in San Diego. Shout out to Josh Hudson. But he's a therapist. Like, he's a therapist and his YouTube channel, he's crushing it. He's got like 15,000 subscribers and his videos are really well edited and he just taught himself how to YouTube, but he's the therapist. Like what? And then I saw a couple people in the swag industry doing podcasts and I told Pal Vinder of Playground Studios and my homie Sergio, I want to do a podcast and I want you guys to do it with me because I'm kind of like the brains, the business guy, and Sergio's the charismatic one that everyone loves. He's so lovable. And Pal is our audio visual guy. So between the three of us, we have something. And I told him for three months I want to do this, and neither of them were down. Pal because he's shy, and Sergio because he loves Howard Stern, and Howard Stern hates on podcasts. And Sergio, Aww. for if you're listening or anyone that knows Sergio, he's what I call a sheeple. You know, if someone says something and the masses agree, then he's going to agree the masses he doesn't really think for himself oh no it sounds like he's a, <laughs> it almost sounds like he's a walking fallacy um but how did you meet like serge and uh palvinder was it through, through the, the young professionals really okay so through yeah. the young professionals the silicon valley young professionals but i'm sure there's just like uh, i'm sure there's like a bunch of other people in that organization so what made those two stand out or what did you make you stand out to them oh interesting question so Yeah, I joined uh, Silicon Valley Young Professionals probably in like 2013 or something. And after being in the group for like six months, um, the chair stepped down and a couple other people left. And it was pretty much Sergio, myself, and maybe one other person. And Sergio looked at me. He worked for the Chamber of Commerce. Uh, The Young Professionals ran through the chamber. So he was kind of like the one that ran the Young Professionals. And we didn't know each other that well. But he goes, well do you want to be chair? Because there's no one else to be chair. And I was like, yeah, I'd love to. And then I revamped uh, the group with Sergio's help because I told him like, hey, you guys are doing like quarterly events. That's not enough for traction. Like you got to do it once a month. And then he was like, no, that's too often. So and we agreed to <laughs> once every other month. And then within a year, we started doing them every month. And as we revamped the committee, Pal, Pal Vinder Jagay, Jagay, uh, from Playground joined the committee and he started doing little promo videos um, for our events as hype events. And obviously I got to know Pal really well because of that. And then Sergio and I just like, he's my brother from another mother. Like he, I have an older brother, but Sergio is my brother. There's been no one in my life that is my brother like Sergio? Like we are straight brothers. Like the our the way we interact is absolutely ridiculous. Um, he's just my brother. You know, we just clicked. So, yeah. Okay, but so. So to answer your question, how did I get into podcasting? Right. So I went to the conference in uh, the na- the largest swag show of the year in January. 
And the two guys in my industry that do podcasting, did a live podcast at the conference. I videoed it on my phone, just like a 30 second clip. I sent it to Pal and I sent it to Sergio. I said, I'm coming home this Thursday. You guys are coming over to my house and we're launching a podcast. And Pal said no. And Sergio said yes. So what? Sergio, yeah, no, no, but Pal ended up helping us. Like Pal, oh. like our intro, he jokingly said no. Um, I, I didn't mean it like that. So Pal helped us like find the equipment. He did our intro. Pal and Playground Studio has been instrumental to my and our success. But Sergio literally came over to my house and I joke that it's like that scene in Zoolander when they're like, it's inside the computer. And they're like, <laughs> uh, hitting the computer. Like Sergio and I were like, I guess we just talk into the computer and hit record. And like, if you listen to the pilot, I go, Welcome to the p -p -p pilot podcast. And Sergio <laughs> always makes fun because I stuttered. And like, yeah, the, the audio is so cracky and so bad. But then I started to listen to podcasts on how to be a podcaster. I went to the the largest pad, a podcast uh, convention within like two or three months. Within three months, we partnered with the Silicon Valley Business Journal and the Silicon Valley Capital Club. We had a 49er Super Bowl champion, our podcast, like in the first 10 episodes. We had crazy. George on our podcast within the first 10 episodes and it just started to really take off like wildfire and fast forward three years later I was named to Silicon Valley's 40 under 40 list and I mean dude that would have never happened if I didn't launch this personal brand and get into podcasting, specifically podcasting, but also the books, the YouTube channel, the blogging, but the podcasting has been the big thing. And what up Silicon Valley, the initial podcast, we end up rebranding it to a media company and brought on other podcasters. Like I said, at the top of the show, I've produced nine podcasts. A media company. How do I not know this? What up Silicon Valley? Yeah, it's a media company. Uh, quote unquote company. Mm -hmm. But yeah, so we do events. Our largest event of the year is Pitch Tank. It's a Shark Tank inspired event at eBay's headquarters. We're taking off a uh, year off this year, but we did it um, every year, four years in a row. But then I had a spiritual awakening and moved from Silicon Valley to Santa Cruz. So that's part of the reason why we took this year off, but we'll be back next year. It seems like this whole process on how you started any of your podcasts, like it, it, you went through like a lot of like, um, <laughs> jumping through like a lot of hoops. And it, it's crazy to think that like in a, in an alternate universe, Pal Vinder is your co-host for, ah. for what up, you know? Yeah. Uh, and it's just so crazy. And, and the only reason why I say that is like, no, no hate on Pal Vinder. It's I because, love Pal. yeah, I know me too. It's because, yeah. you know, like, cause uh, yeah, I work on a lot of video projects and he's like a super talented director. So I cannot see him on a podcast whatsoever. And for me, it's like, if you were to ask me like, oh, well, how did you get into podcasting MJ? It's like, oh, well, I just hung out with Sam. <laughs> and then if you want to ask, and then now we just have your, your whole story. That, so that's pretty much how I started. It's I not, love that I could pass it on. <laughs> like, I, 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 I'm so, that makes me so humbled. I love to hear that. You know, like I, my whole thing, you know me, I'm all about pay it forward. Love that. Mm -hmm. What's your goal with uh, Soul Seeker? Because man, Soul Seeker is so sick. That, that's Dude, a, the intro is just like, let me tell you, like. Uh, surrender. <laughs> I know, it's just like, it's just so. I don't know play, uh, the clip. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna okay. I'm gonna edit in your intro right now. I hope you guys enjoyed that intro because that was a banger intro because it just gets you in the mood. Like, man, I'm trying to I'm trying to be awake. Surrender, you know. Um, so that. That's and shout out to Pal. He helped me find the music for that too. Or was that you? I think that was Pal. You helped was, me with it was, it was definitely Pal. Yeah, you helped me with Eat Up and Unboxing Show. But um you uh, do you, for your listeners, um HBO show Westworld. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure if you watch it. I'm familiar with it. Okay, cool. But I'm sure some of the listeners watch it and there's the scene that keeps replaying and one of the characters keeps hearing, Remember, remember. <laughs> Sounds like uh, uh, Mufasa from Lion King. Maybe. Yeah, 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 yeah. But so my thing is like with spirituality, like whether it's like spirituality or plant medicine, surrender. Like one of the biggest lessons ayahuasca taught me is resistance creates pain. Like we need to surrender. I tell my friends, like think of surrender as an acceptance. The more you resist and you don't accept, you're just creating more pain. So 
I wanted to do a shout out of surrender. So I had my friend that I did ayahuasca with. I, I record her say surrender. And then pal at Playground Studios, who we've been talking about, it like did an echo effect. So you can't totally hear her saying surrender. It's mm-hmm. like surrender. Like you, you guys just heard it. You know? Yeah. So that's that's part of the intro. But you said, what's your goal for Soul Seeker? So it's funny you say that because I have no goal. Um, it's the first time I'm doing something a long time with no goal. And my intention was with, for Soul Seeker was to not stress about doing an episode every week because part of what they say with content creation or podcasting specifically is you need to find a cadence and stick with it. Whether it's weekly, it's bi-weekly, it's monthly, whatever it is, do that and drop it the same time, the same uh, day, and the same cadence every single episode. And I've stressed my out, myself out specifically with Mojo Mondays when I had that podcast trying to get Mojo Mondays out every single Monday morning. I said, you know what? Soul Seeker is not about mon- monetization. It's not about um, funneling to my business like you mentioned earlier or anything. It's literally therapy for me, therapy for my guests, and therapy for the listeners and with the hope of raising the collective consciousness. So with that said, what happened? And I got I got into the same cycle of where I started to release it every single week. And after like seven episodes, I was like, what the hell am I doing? Like I'm stressing out over this. And I took a little bit of a break. And, um, over Soul Seeker? Yeah. Okay. I t- I, I've taken a bunch of breaks with it because that's the thing. I release episodes when I want to. Sometimes I might r- release four episodes in a two-week span or something. Other times I might go a month, six weeks, and not release an episode because it's I'm trying not to force anything on and to not stress myself out. And with that, I wrote a book called The Written Goal. This is the first year I have not written any goals or really made any goals. Like part of my whole spiritual awakening is like just surrendering mm-hmm. to the flow of life and not putting so much, um, so many expectations on outcomes, you know? But I think that's really healthy though, because I'm seeing all the content you put out for a soul seeker. It seems very um, organic. It's, it doesn't seem like it's forced or anything, but you, you've been pretty good about the content. You mean the quality versus the quantity? Is that what you mean? Um, the qu- the quality. I mean, um, or what do you mean? I've been good about the content. Like I like I've been seeing it. Like I've I've been noticing that you're you're publishing. Which, you're- by the way, bro, mm-hmm. thank you. Oh. I'm in Aubrey Marcus's Fit for Service Mastermind. I just got back from Tulum, and they had a whole workshop on receiving, and. Um, a lot of times I don't receive. So thank you. I, I see you. I appreciate that. Thank you. Um, yeah. No, part of Soul Seeker at the beginning was I was posting every single day and that was stressing me out. But um, no, I'm, uh, yeah, I'm pretty good about the content. And um, yeah, I appreciate that. But where do you draw the line when you're, uh, when you, you talk about surrendering because, mm. because of course we have responsibilities. We, we can't just like, all right, well, I'm just going to freaking sit here until midnight and then, you know, I'm, I'm just going to surrender. Put it this way. Um, great question, but put it this way. Like say you're on your way at work and your car tire blows out or, you know, you run out of gas on the side of the freeway and you need to call AAA and you're going to be late to work. Something like that. All of us get triggered and get really angry and we get really stressed and we get really frustrated and none of that is going to make a difference. It's surrendering to being like, okay, I am going to handle this situation and I'm going to get myself out of it, but I'm not going to get all worked up because getting all worked up is not going to change anything. Or maybe it's an ex-girlfriend and you're trying to get her back or ex-boyfriend or something like that. Like It's more about that type of stuff. Um, There are... I mean, you'll you'll know when you're surrendering to an experience. But yeah, it's not just like, oh, white, uh, raise the white flag. I give up to the world, and I'm just going to be a hobo or whatever. You know, like yeah, okay. That, okay. Does that make more sense? No, I know exactly what you mean because I do that all the time. Um, for example, if I if I'm on the way to work or anything like that, and I hit traffic, and I'm just like, well, that <laughs> I can't control. That's a f- external factor that I I can't do anything about. Right. But how many people? get worked up over that oh like all the time i yeah. think i like i virtually have no uh i want to say no road rage well okay i mean things like that but yeah yeah, yeah. that's good that's good yeah but i i feel like when i have road rage i, I <laughs> i'm looking at it in like a darker way where it's just like like if somebody cuts me off or somebody's like uh just being super aggressive i'm just like you know what 
this guy's not going to lose sleep over me tonight, so <laughs> I'm not going to lose sleep over this asshole. I love that. It's such great perspective. Yeah. Hmm. <sighs> Feels good to breathe. Yeah, you know, I'm going to breathe because in a lot of your um nope i'm not even not even a uh, soul seeker it's in when i listen to uh clone yourself podcast you tell us to breathe oh nice so it's not even it's funny because you go into uh the clone yourself podcast which by the way everybody it's all about efficiency which is super cool because i, I gotta say i really even though um even though i'm not part of your mastermind or anything like that i think hard work the hard work ethic is so overrated now man like i don't want to i don't I, I would rather work efficient my whole life than work hard totally uh, do i sound lazy no here's the thing you can be recording so many more podcasts if you're not the one doing the podcast editing and the video editing like if you're stu- like you're a videographer so it's different like you might want to because that's part of you like showing your services right but maybe graphic design, right? Like, I don't know if you, even Canva, you could use Canva, but you don't need to be doing that. Like you shouldn't be wasting your time on that because that's not necessary for you. Your strengths are videography and you're selling that. So it makes sense. But for me, I work with VAs to do the videography and the podcast editing so I can pump out more videos and more podcasts. And that, and that's where I think is a really good, um, uh, where I bring up this really good point where it's, if you really count the numbers on how much videos and photos and content you're publishing, you're you're beating me about maybe I want to say 20 times over. And look here, I am a paid I'm a professional content creator, but somehow you not a professional content well well not a, like a professional videographer or photographer, you're still pumping out content more than me. So like that that really does mean something, especially with the with the virtual assistants. If anybody doesn't know what a VA is, yeah, 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 uh, yeah. No, totally. I mean, people have asked me like, how are you able to do so much over the years? And that's the market dictated. My first book was going to be how to work with virtual assistants. I never wanted to be known as the VA guy. Now a lot of people know me as the VA guy, but people ask me, how are you able to do so much? And I would look at them and say, VAs. They'd say, what's a VA? I'd say virtual assistant. They'd be like, what's a virtual assistant? This is in Silicon Valley. So that's when I knew like, oh, there's something to this. So I started, uh, I wrote a book on it and then I started a blog about virtual assistants. And then I have a new business where I teach entrepreneurs how to scale their business by building out a virtual assistant team. And that is Clone Yourself um, podcast as well. How do you know when you're ready for a, uh, a VA? Because see, look, I'm I'm self-employed as well, right. but it's just like it's hard to dictate when when it when it is time. So you go to clone yourself the letter U dot com. That's clone yourself then just the letter U dot com, and you click on the tab that says ROI of a VA, and you use the calculator on my website that the virtual assistants built. Um, basically, I'll I'll say it like this. As an entrepreneur, a minimum your time is worth $100 an hour. So if you are anything other than a graphic designer um, specifically, and you are spending time doing any sort of graphic design, you are wasting your time. You need to give virtual assistant for that. You can put in $100 for your hour, hourly wage, put one hour, and it will obviously say, oh, you spent $100. Then you could say, oh, I'll hire a VA graphic designer for one hour, say $30 an hour, which is really high. You can definitely get them for less. And then it'll spit out the savings. And it'll say, you saved $70 and you got an hour back of your time. At that point, you can expand on the numbers from there and keep going. But it really comes down to your personal budget. Like You have to use that calculator and look at what your budget is as well. Does that help? Yeah, definitely. So, I mean, but if it, if you're only doing, uh, if, so there's VAs for graphic design. Are there VAs for other things like sales too, emailing? So I uh, so when I'm done with the podcast, I send my project manager the Google Drive link with the video and the audio, if there's video on that one. Then she works with the podcast editor VA to edit it. Then the 
project manager also works with the graphic designer and gives her the title and manages her. Then she also works with the website manager to get it up on the website. And my project manager writes the show notes and everything else. So as soon as I'm done, the project manager takes care of everything. I just use graphic design as an example because a lot of content creators or entrepreneurs um, need graphic design and a lot of solopreneurs and new entrepreneurs will default to doing the design themselves on Canva. So it usually resonates. Now, you asked if you can have a VA for sales. I teach that you want to start with objective tasks versus subjective. Objective meaning that the task is done correct or incorrect, whereas subjective requires room for interpretation. Yes, graphic design requires some interpretation. But for that reason, but for that reason, if you go to cloneyourselfu.com and you click the tab that says freebies, you can get my free brand guidelines template where you can use that to put your fonts, your all the different variations of your logo, your do's and don'ts, your colors and all that and a mood board so that it becomes less interpreta- interpretive. Having said all of that, sales is pretty subjective. If you really have your sales process dialed in and you know it very well, and you have virtual uh, assistant experience and managing VAs, then I'd say go for it. However, if you don't have VA experience and you don't have your sales process dialed in, that is definitely an advanced skill that you can work up to, but not something to start off with. Okay. You can tell that I've been talking about VAs a lot, right? Oh, no, definitely. (laughs) So I would say like... uh, in short terms, what I'm getting from this, VAs really allow you to focus on what your strengths are. So, for example, like um, when I when I brought my car to the shop the other day, um, the mechanic says like, "Okay, well, well, what's wrong with your car?" And then I told him he puts everything he put everything that was wrong with my car in the computer, and then he just went straight to work on it. So he didn't even have to go through the whole like sales process and blah blah blah. He was focusing on fixing my car. That's why he was so good at fixing my car and he did it efficiently. Rather than trying to be really good at using um, his Excel spreadsheet, he, you know, he lets... Preach! It, yeah, exactly. So he just lets, um, you know, somebody else do that. So I think um, in in my case, I, I would... A, a VA would be really good if I were to... Let's see. As a videographer, probably these podcasts. To edit your podcast. Edit my podcast. Yeah, totally. So like for me, most of my podcasts, I don't have to edit the in-between. It's just like the intro and outro. But every now and then there's things that happen where I do need to edit the middle. And in that case, I listen to the podcast and then... I um, write down the timestamp and I just ask the VA to make the edit there. So yeah, there's ways to get around that. But I think it's episode number seven of Clone Yourself. Either way, the first 15 episodes walk you step by step in a sequential format of how I get started with VAs. But I think it's episode seven where I talk about the time audit and the skills thrills uh, worksheet. And those are a couple of worksheets that will help you uncover the tasks that you are currently doing and then help you prioritize those as to which ones would be a good idea to outsource to a virtual assistant first. Hmm. Okay. Where are you putting S- it? What? 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 Where oh, putting sorry. It? I didn't mean to distract you. Speaking of those times, you're going to have to edit out. My bad. Oh, no. It's fine. It's totally fine. Do you ever clap? Or I heard if you click the button, it makes a line, too. I, I haven't wanted to chance it, but sometimes if you clap in editing, you can see it. You listen oh. the whole thing. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I'll just do a spike right there. Um, okay keep going so i'm i'm just assuming that the the whole va thing is working out for you because i when i come out here and visit you i I never never working you're never working dude you're never like if you like sam if you won the lottery and you didn't you can tell me if you see if there's like a black market lottery you can tell me because from what i understand you work maybe what four hours a week, and there's this one time I called you. You were you were working on a on a cliffside over here. On a cliffside? Oh, I don't know. You said you're you're like oh yeah, I'm at the beach right now working on some emails. Oh yeah, sometimes I'll just uh, ride my bike to the beach and then do emails uh, at the beach. Uh, I, I do that quite often. Um, no, I say I work less than four hours a day. Um, 
it just depends on the day. But in my swag business, that is, um, my other time is spent on the the podcasts, the video shows, the blogs, books, things like that, um, or just you know living life because that's what it's about. But yeah, for the swag business, I kind of have it down. Um, I do have to do pre sales. So you asked about VAs and sales. That's one area I haven't taken on yet, and I don't feel I, that's my strength. You know, I'm not. I don't feel like I could really outsource that. But if I were to outsource that, then I would go from working like less than four hours a day to like working thirty minutes a day. So maybe, and since I'm not trying to build out the swag business more, I'm just trying to figure out what my next career move is. Um, I'm not really trying to like crack the code per se. Any ideas on what that next career move is? Clone yourself, bro. I just launched my first mastermind where I'm teaching entrepreneurs how to uh, work less and make more so they can play more. Um, I have an online course for clone yourself. And um, yeah, I'm slowly chipping away. I have some sponsors for our Eat Up Silicon Valley food show and things like that. Um, None of this, it's all good side hustle money right now because it's all less than a year doing this type of stuff. Like directly monetizing my uh, my content because it's always been a lead funnel. This is like my first year of really focusing on directly monetizing it. And right now it's just side hustle money. But as I build it, you know, hopefully it could be a career. What so. what is that? It's the first time you mentioned it on the show, uh, Eat Up Silicon Valley. Oh, th- this is our food show. On is it YouTube. connected to What Up the podcast? <laughs> yeah, there's uh, some continuity. You like brand continuity, right? Oh yeah. There's some brand continuity. So when I say What Up Silicon Valley is a media network, um, has multiple podcasts. We do events, and we also have a YouTube show called Eat Up Silicon Valley that highlights mostly South Bay non-chain restaurants. We've done quite a few in Santa Cruz. We've done a couple in San Francisco, um, but for the most part, we try to highlight South Bay non-chain restaurants. And it's kind of like diner drive-ins and dives. Um, so, so you're like Guy Fieri? Yeah, Sergio, my co-host, my brother I talked about earlier, likes to say that I'm like Guy Fieri and he's like Anthony Bourdain in Whoa, the show. Whoa, hold on. I know, oh, right? What? Right? What? Yeah, Sergio, like no. Bourdain, I know. Nobody will, well, first of all, nobody will ever watch a, a, a crossover of Bourdain and Guy Fieri. Well, well you I don't been? know about that, but first off, like, Sergio is just as much like, okay, I'm more of a bro and douchey, uh, so I'm like Guy, but Sergio is not like uh, or how Bourdain was at all. Well, He's way closer w- guy. Yeah, I would say like, I mean... Which, by the way, I just got back from San Diego. I went, ho dads. Have you seen that episode of Diners, Drive-Ins, and Dives with Guy? I, I don't watch Guy Fieri. Okay, well, I got the uh, Guy Fieri burger because he, he was down there. It's a burger with pastrami on it and some other stuff. It's pretty good. Any good? Okay, because okay. I went to Johnny Garlic's and I was just like, eh, oh yeah, that is know. his restaurant. That's a chain, bro. Uh, yeah, it's I don't, a yeah. chain. I don't know how I feel about Johnny yeah, Garlic's. Yeah, Johnny Garlic's. I, yeah. <laughs> so shout out to Johnny Garlic. Now yeah. shout out to Black Point Market in mm-hmm. Zankers. Like a little tiny place like that is the type of place that we highlight. Okay. Well, I don't think any of you. Uh, I, I, I don't think you're like Guy Fieri. I would say you're Thanks, more. Man. Um, I think. In terms of food, because um, I have uh, helped you film, I think, what, two episodes of, of Eat Up Silicon Valley, something like that? At least two. Yeah, and I would say you're more similar to uh, Action Bronson. Are you familiar with Action Bronson? Name sounds familiar. I know I should know. Well, he's a professional chef, but he's also like a rapper, too. So he's a professional chef, rapper, and like um, he's known for um, for throwing people off of his stage. Like pe- like fans at his rap concerts, they jump on stage, and like it's <laughs> it is uh, it's tradition for them to get like body slammed by this. And and Action Bronson is like a is like a 300, <laughs> 300 pound dude. He's a big dude. Okay, so you're calling me fat ass. No, so if no, I'm joking, so if Sergio <laughs> were here, he's not. So I'll speak up for him. He would be like, no, 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 no. That's not Sam at all because Sergio loves rap and hip hop and all that and like I don't even really per se like music that much (laughs) you know I mean let alone like rap and hip hop and all that type of stuff so ah, maybe I'll have to check it out but thanks anyway yeah so eat up SV as in Silicon Valley eat up SV.com you can check it out cool man thanks for the plug bro Dude, hell yeah. You know what? We're at the end of our time right now. I would say a lot of the listeners here are just starting out their solopreneurship, um, 
self uh, filing under self employed for the first time this year, maybe. Congratulations. Can you, uh, any tips or, or pointers? Because, because here's the thing in, in Silicon Valley, me included, we, we have this, this culture where it's like, man, if you're not a workaholic out here in the Valley, what are you even doing, man? You, you're not working seven days a week. Yeah, man. Kidding I say, me? I say I'm a recovering workaholic. Um, I call it soul life balance. That's what I talk about in, in Soul Seeker. But no, I would say reach out to me as MJ knows. You know, I love to mentor and, you know, um, anything I can do, you know, feel free to pick my brain. I think Mojo Mondays is a great podcast for any entrepreneurs. There's a lot of good tips in there. Obviously, clone yourself. There's a lot of like straight business tips. And then if you're into the mindfulness thing, uh, Soul Seeker, but that's not business focus. But depending on your business, like it's a very broad thing. There's a lot of different ways to go. And I think it's um, kind of having tunnel vision, knowing uh, where you want to go. You know, like Simon Sinek, you know, start with why. If you really have that down, then when times get tough, you can always go back to your why. Yeah, absolutely. I think anybody listening, though, um, Sam has mentioned so many different uh, podcasts that he's about. I would start off with Mojo Mondays. That's what I would recommend just for, you know, just for my audience in particular, because yeah. when I first met you, I was just like, man, what? I was like, man, who is this guy? I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to search him up. Yeah. And, <laughs> and literally I was like, I thought I was going to blow my car speakers out <laughs> when I listened to your first it's episode. So funny. Um, but you know, you really, you really have come a, a long way. And, um, and, uh, I, I do want to let you know, I, I do appreciate the network that, and, and the value and the knowledge that you've shared with me over this past year. Um, it's something that I'm constantly pushing myself to, uh, to apply even the super simple things. Like even on, uh, I think on the early episodes of Mojo Monday, you were saying just, just writing down your tasks the night before and just keeping yourself organized. So you're, um, you're, as productive as possible. That's something I'm still doing today. Um, so Damn. that's something I got from uh, from your podcast. And and you Love know that. the thing about uh, writing down the things you want to get done the next day, it actually helps you sleep. Yeah, it does. Yeah, I used to have such big sleeping issues where I was just like, fuck, man, what do I got to do tomorrow? Like, how can I, what can I do? What's the next step to scale your business? Because if you don't have a plan for the next day, um, a lot of times I found myself, I would be sitting in bed staring at the dark ceiling and I'd be like, I was like, man, like I want to get, I want, I want my freelancing to get to this point. But like, since I didn't, wasn't writing any plans down, I didn't know how to work backwards from it. Yes. So. No, I, I forget all those episodes. So I'd love to hear that. And it's, it's it warms my heart to hear that it's made such a big impact. That's awesome. Yeah. Love it. Cool, man. Hey, well, you know what? Thank you so much for coming on to the Creative Crucible podcast and bringing us to what beach is this? We're at uh, Twin Lakes. Okay, I feel like we should have mentioned that earlier, but whatever. No, we don't want to give away this. Uh, so my Santa Cruz friends don't like it when I highlight Santa Cruz in my content because they're like, no, don't bring the Silicon Valley people over because you know how Santa Cruz people are. But um, no, thank you so much for having me, MJ. Like, I got to tell you, like, you crush it as a host and an interviewer and like you extracted some great things out of me. And I feel like this is the, the best interview that someone's done of me. So thank you. And I, I love to see you moving on with your journey and you're, you're crushing it, bro. Proud of you. Sick, man. Thank you so much for every, uh, to everybody listening. And if you're interested in listening to some of Sam's podcast or checking out some of his content, I'm going to have it in the show notes below, whether that's on Spotify, Apple podcast, or even YouTube. Peace out. Thanks. Hey, thank you so much for listening to the Creative Crucible podcast. If you like that podcast episode, please feel free to hit the five-star rating on Apple Podcast or Spotify, and we would love it so much if you could comment down below.